Hey, das geht da hinten nicht, das muss hier gehen. Weißt du, wie das geht? All right, good. It's nice to see the full audience here. Okay, so everything good comes to an end and very good things come to an end faster than one expects. And today is already the last day of our summer school. Days full of interesting input and work, making friends, having fun, seeing Munich lay behind us. And as we have some people here in the first row, that did not participate, and as you might have so many impressions that you don't even remember, I want to give a short wrap-up. I tried to start the drone video yesterday, I tried once again today, let's see if it uh, will run through this time. Of course not, so I have a backup of course, so let's go to the other tool, not to the email, but to this one here. Okay, so there you see already that we had uh, obviously quite some fun here. Welcome to the fourth day of the summer school. So, presenter is also not working anymore. It was the same with my keynote actually. So let's restart this. Oh, it's not going on of course. But I also have a backup for that. Don't worry. I did not prepare that it fails, but I'm also not surprised that it does. I just one minute ago, it was still working very well. Okay, so, oh, this one is also not doing anything. <laughs> now it's working, just kidding. Okay, so, um, yeah, first of all, we have uh, several people and uh, organizations that were supporting us. So we have the Campus AD, we have the Siemens CKI, we have uh, TUM, we have IMT, we have the Smart Space team, we have the German French Academy, and we also have the deutsch französische Hochschule, Université franco allemande hopefully. And uh, yeah, with these partners, it was possible to implement what we did because, of course, we also needed support to organize such a big event. So thank you very much for this support. Brief wrap up of the agenda. So this was our Monday, and as you can see, it's a little difficult to read maybe. Okay, for you it's better to read than for me on the control screen on the back. So when we thought about how do we do the program, we thought, okay, let's do Monday input day. People get a lot of input. We have several keynotes, several lectures. For the other days, as you will see, we did it differently. For the other days, the people had time. What's happening now? People had time to work on their challenges and uh, we only interrupted those by two keynotes per day, or one keynote and one lecture per day. And on the first day, we had uh, the following events. So the opening, after the opening, oh, I put the pictures to the wrong position. So we first did the opening. So um, Nicola, who already had to leave, and Arne, who's sitting in the back, and I did the opening the first day. And the opening keynote was held by Chris Winkler and me. We did the introduction to IoT meets AI. Afterwards, we had a lecture by Sumia, who was talking about IoT protocols and middleware. Then we had a talk by Arne about IoT composition. Then in the afternoon, we had a lecture by Dan about IoT semantics. And then we had a lecture by Laurent about long-range radio for IoT, and then we had a presentation of the challenges by Bettina May. She gave an introduction to the setting of such pitches, gave some input how you can do a good pitch, and then the challenge heads presented the challenges because, as you know, we had four challenges the students were working on, and each of the challenges had a head and a team of between four and eight people. So we had really lots of people supporting us here. Then, this was not enough, of course. An important part of the summer school is always that the people get to know each other. And therefore, 
the last action point on that day was a one minute madness. Every one of you was stepping here, was presenting briefly what you're doing. This was the first getting to know what the others are doing. And I hope through the days you got to know each other much better and you had nice discussions and exchange. And I also made you create a poster and all the posters get really great. We have a poster from everybody now hanging on the walls there. And so if you from the jury are interested, you can have a look. They are there, then you can see who are the participants and what are their current research questions, what are they doing. Okay, and then, of course, social event, very important. I insisted on having that. First day, we did a tour through from the, from the surfer wave up to the Marienplatz. We visited some places there, so this is probably familiar to you. This is in the Hofgarten with the Teatina Church in the back. And then afterwards, we went to the Augustina, because of course, when you come to Munich, you have to taste good beer, and the Augustina is a good place to do so. So we had a nice evening there, and this concluded the first day. The second day started with a talk by Dennis Kompass, and uh, here's a picture of it. So he was talking about challenges around industrial IoT. Then we had a hands-on introduction to machine learning, given by Lars and Christian, who are there in the back. Then in the afternoon, we had a lecture by Ingo. He was talking about IoT and AI in the industry. And then we had a hands-on given by Harald about the Siemens and Peel. And then one social event is not enough. I insisted on having two of them. The second day, I promised the people we'll visit the Oktoberfest. So of course, the Oktoberfest is not open, therefore we walked aside the Oktoberfest, um, which was also very nice. Interestingly, so we had planned a bigger tour. The students were so much into working on their challenges that we skipped half of the city tour and only went around Oktoberfest and then to another beer garden there. And this is a picture of everybody in front of the Oktoberfest. And the day ended then in the beer garden there. And on the next day, we had a keynote on IoT security, which I was given, giving. And uh, then we had a lecture by Nicolas, which was about standard approach and short range radio. And then the rest of the day was dedicated to the challenges. So if you would have been here yesterday, you would have found lots of pizzas on the ground because the people were hanging here until midnight. We were still meeting with the last teams actually around midnight yesterday. And so they were really hard, really working hard on getting the challenges implemented. Okay, and today is already Thursday, and uh, today the people were finishing their work on the challenges, they were finishing their slides, their pitch preparation, and uh, as we see here already, we have today now the presentation of the pitches to the jury, and then we have the award ceremony, and uh, to, to give you a little more detail on it, so we'll have in a minute, so Fabian will now present how it works with the challenges, and then afterwards, so and the jury will take notes, of course, and afterwards the jury will go upstairs with Katerina and discuss a little bit which one they like the most and think about that. And during that time, for all the others here, we will hand over to you the certificates and we'll also hand over to you the presents here. Do we say what is in or we just make it a secret? Later. We say it later, okay. And then there's also this thing here. And so the winners of the challenge, they can win the mug here. And there's also the logo laser engraved here on front. It's uh, very nice. So this is another motivation for doing a very good presentation here. And uh, yeah, so then you get this. Then the jury is coming back. Then we do the award ceremony, handing over the awardees a certificate that they won the challenge and also a winning prize here and then we will continue because then everybody will be here again. Okay, that's that. Let's see, oh, yeah, I have something more because Fabian also reminded me on that. If you take pictures, you can upload them here or directly on Twitter. So here's our Twitter wall. Here's everything that was uh, Twitter to before. And if you did not Twitter yet, it's a good chance to do so now. Someone in the stream, you can also Twitter. We are happy about every tweet that is upcoming there. Um, if you do not want to share the pictures here, you can upload them there where I'm just showing. So we have a special upload website where you can do that. Then we have all social media that I could get um, hold of. So we have Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and also a blog where I managed to write a report of the first day. I also write reports about the other days. 
and uh, our hashtag is IoT AI. Maybe one comment, if you're interested in the presentations, you can find every presentation also here on this YouTube link and yeah, you can enjoy it again. Indeed, we could record it everything. It's live the moment we finish with the streaming. And also when you go to the agenda on schoolfutureiot.org, you see directly a link to each talk after the, after the agenda entry. Another thing that we have is an offline Twitter picture wall. This is the thing that you see in the back. If you have time later, you can have a look again because uh, several of you also contributed to this and it's also a nice capture of what we did in the, in the past days with some very nice impressions. And yeah, this is the Twitter wall as said before. And oh yeah, we also have on the monitor there that is now showing my picture at the moment, we also have a game where the people can play a little bit. And so this was also one of the challenges that the students were working on. Okay, and that said, I hand over to Fabian. So thank you, Marco Oliver. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome you too, um, especially our jury. And what I would like to do now is, I, first of all, I would like to introduce the jury a little bit, so who's in. And afterwards, I would like to give an overview about the pitch session and also about the criteria where the jury will rate on. So, do you have the jury slide for me? Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, okay, first of all, we have three colleagues from Siemens. Um, it's first of all Stefan Weiss, he's in the office of our CEO, CTO and uh, management board member uh, Dr. Roland Busch. Then we have the head of Sematic Systems Support, it's Thomas Kalnick. And the third one is our colleague from also Digital Industry, it's an accelerator program, uh, not an accelerator, a startup inside Siemens, it's um, Group Zero Engineering from Ayane Suta. So, and then we have partners from our CKI, the Center of Knowledge Interchange. Here, especially Sebastian Steinhorst, he's a professor at the TU Munich, and he's working on embedded systems yeah, and other topics which are really correlated to Siemens. Further, we have two colleagues from the German French Academy. Um, first of all, the CEO, uh, uh, C IO from uh, Axel, oh, it's Axel Honstor from the Franco German Forum, and then the CIO for uh, is Emmanuel Picard here from Elm LeBlanc. Le Elm LeBlanc is a part of Roche. Good, that's all about the jury. Now I would like to go more in detail about the pitch setup. Um, we set up the following first of all, you will get a short introduction of the challenge heads. The challenge heads are from TU Munich, um, from the IMT and also from Siemens. Only two minutes that everybody knows a little bit what was the idea, what was the challenge which the participants should solve. And then our participants, our students and PhDs will present their results. Let's say 10 minutes. If they need two minutes more, it's okay. Afterwards, we will stop it. So. And then, last but not least, we will have a short question round, something like three minutes. And after this question round, the um, two jury members will also give a short feedback. Good. And you see, then we will change or switch to the next topic. After the pitch, uh, Mark Oliver mentioned it before, the jury will go up and will uh, rate and evaluate the winners of the team and then you will come back and we will award the teams. And now you can see on the right side what are the evaluation criteria. Um, we set up six different points, creativity, innovativeness, then implementation, relevance for research, the business case, the presentation style, and of course also um, a little bit the behavior of the group in the question and answering around. So that's more from my... Yeah. Maybe uh, to add, so. For, for you as participants now, so why, why did we do that? So also one thing that you can learn now is when you, for instance, make a startup later and want to pitch something, how this works. So this is one aspect. And therefore, it's not only about being nervous and being forced to present something here now, but also seeing how is it, what are criteria people are looking at, how do the others perform. And so this is what I invite you to do now in the other presentations. 
and maybe one second point for the jury is also clear you have this link from me from the Google formula where you have or can rate or should rate in parallel uh, each pitch perfect good then let's start with the pitch um, we will start with challenge number one the challenge head is Florian Grams he's from digital industry um, yeah it's also a colleague from Siemens Thank you. So, first of all, thank you all, my participants. It was a great two days hacking. Uh, we had amazing interest and we learned so much. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And also, thank you very much to Johannes, Harald, and Sally from Siemens who helped me uh, for this really challenging task. So what did we did? We had like uh, a newest toys from Siemens, an AGV. Uh, with the Orb controller, with microdrives, with Edge, with AI, and we really managed to do the first part that normally would took you in a normal environment about one or two months in just two days. So we didn't quite finish it, but we are like half a half a day there, and um, the challenge of it is to get, get all the information together and then bring our robot to uh, this cone, so it will uh, find its way wherever, um, not really focusing on the environment, it can detect this a cone with the AI and get to this position. That was our task, and now I'm really thrilled to see what my uh, doctorants uh, did out of this. Thank you. So you, you want to have a second microphone? Uh, I think we can just pass one around. Can we have the presenter? No. Oh yeah, maybe you can the second. Yeah, it's okay. Fabian, will you take Fabian, will uh, you time and give them a signal? Give when them a signal okay. When? Okay. Okay, hello, okay. hello everyone. Hello. My name is Benjamin. Benjamin. I'm part, Benjamin. Of, the I'm part of the technology innovation team at Reno. And today my team and, and I are really happy to really have this opportunity to, this opportunity to share some of the latest some innovations, some of the latest and, innovations advances and advances our team did. Our team so, did. so I think most of you have most seen most these have autonomous, seen autonomous guided, guided, guided vehicles in place. I heard we have people from Siemens here. For example, in the GVE in Erlangen, they have these autonomous vehicles running around in the factory. But also at Bosch in Nuremberg in the main factory, they use these autonomous vehicles to maneuver parts maneuver between parts different between manufacturing, manufacturing lines, lines and to deliver parts like in process. Like I, guess process I guess also from Amazon also from these vehicles Amazon, are really popular, really popular where they popular, drive around in these big storage halls and deliver the shelves to the position they need to go to. And I mean why are these things so popular? The advantage is that you don't have to have a planned track where every good needs to go but you can select flexible plan where does everything need to go. You can adapt to changing situations. I mean these big industrial halls they're good for that. There's a lot of infrastructure, the, they're like, the, they're there's like, wireless there's connection, wireless you have cloud connection, connectivity, you can compute everywhere, like the situation, like is, the situation is known. Is but how do you leverage do you these leverage advantages, these advantages in, more in more challenging environments? For example, in a construction, example, side, in construction side, where maybe the maybe scenery will, the will change every, every day as things are being built, built will, the situation will look different every day. There might be there dust, might it might be rainy, might the situations rainy, will, the change. will change. People are different, People it's an open environment, it's not, not as close, the manufacturing hall. So how can you use these benefits autonomous vehicles give you in such a more challenging environment? And I mean, the answer to that is like everything, just use a 
AI. AI, AI can, AI can automatically, automatically detect, like, detect everything. like everything, so you can so train you can it to detect, train like, it to detect like, for example, like a tool, like a drain, drain, if it's drain, dusty, if it's whatever, dusty, just whatever, use it. The problem is, though, for example, if you dig a tunnel, there is no internet connectivity down there. You can't just, like, use a cloud server like AWS to compute your neural network. And we're not, like, a Google company. We can't just put a Raspberry Pi on top of it. It needs to be certified. We're in Germany. We need to have norms, standardized, safe equipment. We can't just use any computer we have. So we need to have, like, industry grade industry equipment grade that can equipment use these can AI use capabilities. These AI and that's exactly and that's what we did exactly at Reno. We, we used Reno. the we most used modern process that Siemens offers, the neural processing neural unit, which is industry grade, industry and put that on an autonomous on vehicle, vehicle to enable this to enable vehicle, this vehicle to have the AI capability on premise without any connectivity to work in these more challenging environments. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Abdullah, the expert of our engineering team, to tell you more about how we realized this. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, um, so, so okay, the other direction. Okay, the other direction. Okay, so okay, now so since, we, now have since we have an idea of what is of what there, is there in, the in the industry, we can sum it up. We can sum it up. So, so um, we need to do um, tasks with the devices to go devices logistics or go to certain so objects. Certain objects. In, the factory, in the factory, it's okay. It's outside, 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 for example, in a construction in a site, construction site uh, or a remote site, uh, we might have no network. There is no central unit for processing, and the environment is not controlled. So, in a nutshell, there is no support for environment change. Change, environment change, and there is no support for dynamic support change of task if we need to uh, work with different, uh, work objects. With different objects. So the idea so here, the what idea we had in mind when, we, when, when we, our development, our development team, team, is the, the first, is the first step, step is to do decentralized, decentralized edge, edge compute. Edge compute. So, at so at the device, we use we use the uh, Siemens uh, NPU, NPU Neural, Neural Processing Unit, Unit to use the AI to technology, use the AI technology on, board. on board. And the next step the next is step to is also to support, support for, um, for um, dynamic, cha dynamic uh, change, change of task uh, in, the sense that in the sense that if the, the robot today would like to would detect like some to object, detect like some cones. object like cones. We will send it some images of cones so, cones so that it can go so for it. Can Tomorrow it's something else. We will upload other images. Other images. Um, we also um, need to map the environment to, map to know where we are and decide how to move through it. And then finally to know our position in the map so localization using any available number of sensors. So for that we use Kalman filters because if you have IMU, we use it. We have 10 IMUs, we use it. We have odometry or laser sensors, we use it together in the filter framework. Uh, so what are the steps in a nutshell? So the laser is not working. So here the first step here is that first we do environmental scan using the leader to get a map of the environment. So this is the second step. And then to know the position of, the, of ourselves in the environment, we use the Kalman filter to reduce the noise. And then to know the object that we would like to go to, we use the AI-based technique using the NMPU. And then we calculate the path to the object. And then finally, this gives us the autonomous capability to drive and navigate through the environment. And then here on the right, I am we're just uh, mentioning the technologies we used. So there is C++, Python, and TIA for totally integrated automation to transfer uh, our work in ROS, the robot operating system, to the NPU. And the main focus here is that, as Benjamin noted, that we have the AI on premise on the robot and on site. Um, okay, so to give an idea how, how, time, how much time we take, so first to generate the data, because for each object we need some images to identify what the object needs to work with. So for that we take our photos with the images, and this takes roughly 20 minutes here on the left up. And then to classify it, to tell the neural network that this image is a cone and this image doesn't have a cone, for instance, so this took us uh, roughly 30 minutes. And then to train actually the neural network, it takes a little bit more of time, but this is an offline phase. Uh, so this took us around two hours. And then finally to transfer it from uh, the, our, the server to the NPU took us roughly two hours. Um, and now I'm going to uh, hand on to Max so that he can give you a little more on the results that we had so far. Hey, so I need this thing. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we already used, as he said, uh, an already existing model, and we used transfer learning to introduce these cones to the model, which we can see worked pretty well on the left side. It got a bit confused with uh, too many of these cones, because uh, there's always the problem if you, you can only introduce so, so and so many pictures into um, the model, because you don't have that much time. 
for one of these things, and here we only used pictures with two cones and not with four cones, so they didn't recognize four cones. So we can see it works fast, but of course, if you uh, work this fast, it sometimes has a few problems still. Um, but it worked pretty well. Uh, we then uh, had the pictures, um, we then get uh, feed from a camera mounted on the robot, and we can see the cones, and we can uh, triangle and approximately the position of the cone in front of the robot, and then give it uh, give this position to a planner, which uses uh, the robot's laser um, scanner, so the robot knows approximately the room around it, which we can see on the right side, and then it will get the position of the, or the approximate position of the uh, cone to navigate to. And since it uses the laser scanner, it can also go around obstacles. I, we have a small video here prepared, and it works, nice. So it looks and it drives. Nice. So now uh, I will hand over to Cristiano, who will tell you something about the future of this project. Thank you, Max. So uh, if you give me the remote controller, maybe I could change. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the other? Maybe this? No? This way? No? Sorry, guys. Which one? This one? OK. Yes. But of course, today we had just scratched the surface. There's a lot of things that we can do to improve our solution. The first thing is to create another layer of AI that can combine together the object detection data and the sensor data and uh, automatically optimize the parameter of the common filter to have a, be a better localization of the robot inside the industrial environment. Then, of course, we can compare this uh, uh, solution with uh, state-of-the-art algorithms like adaptive Monte Carlo localization and then try other techniques like uh, data commentation to have uh, uh, more training examples but less pictures to take of the object uh, that we want to follow. And of course, the goal is to have a final and uh, uh, seamless uh, human-to-robot interaction. So to recap, I hope that, okay, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> to recap, we presented today Rhino, that is an autonomous guided vehicle that is capable to adapt it, uh, select the target, and also works in industrial environment. Of course, the uh, more important uh, topic of this uh, work is that we use AI in the edge, in the industrial environment, to uh, automatically choose the goal and uh, automatically adapt to the human intervention. So thank you so much for your attention. That's all. And that's... Mm -hmm. Uh, that's us. <laughs> Thank you. So perfect. Thanks again. Thank you. You are totally in time. So means we can go now directly to the question and answer session. So do you have some question here in our audience? Yeah. Uh, so the actual training is uh, has to be done on the PC because uh, on the robot we cannot mount that much of much much power in in the end. So it only classifies on the thing, but which is kind of the advantage of neural networks. They take a lot of time to train, but then if they are trained, they are very fast at recognizing things. Okay. One question from my side is: um, I saw that for you now train the network on cones. And this took you about like four or five hours. So this means like, um, and you said like you can scale this to other environments. So whenever you go for another environment and you have new objects, this always takes about five hours to train them? I mean, the takeaway message was kind of the opposite because what you normally hear, hear is exactly this thing, like what happens if the environment changes? There, it takes so much effort. We need to have an expert sit down for like days, weeks to label data, to classify the data. Whereas we're saying like if there's a new object integrated, the labeling process took us less than an hour. So if you were saying, okay, now we're in the construction side where they don't use the red cones, but like blue ones or something, you need to spend one hour to like, re, like manual effort 
reconfiguring this network. And I mean, the training itself, that runs overnight. And the two hours to configure it in the TIA portal, that took us so long because we're computer scientists, and that's like autonomy, like, automation engineering, so it was really new for us. Whereas if you would have an automation engineer do that, it's probably five minutes because it's just clicking deploy. So we're trying to say like, it's really fast to adopt this network to new situations as it's less than an hour manual effort. Do you already have first thoughts on your addressable market and your uh, business model you would pursue with this idea? Uh, so I can say a tell a little bit about this application because on the one hand side, I mean it was a nice demo application to show what it can do, but that is also from our first customer we're working with, which is like a roadside construction company, because what they noticed that this, the most dangerous task in roadside construction is putting down these cones because when you need to pick them up, then there is no marking anymore. So that's when the cars don't see there is construction work going on. So they are looking for a robot that can drive around these roads identify the cones and just have a robot arm mounted on top of the vehicle to pick up the cones. So this doesn't need to be done by humans anymore to really reduce the danger in roadside construction. So that's the first use case we're working with, but we're looking at other big construction companies. So we're on the search for other applications, but that's the one we have so far. So maybe one last question is here, maybe one. Yeah. Maybe a quick one. How approximate are you guys already? Like, how close can you get to the cone? Because, like, in industrial applications, it's always like you have to be very, very exact, you know, on the point. Maybe somebody else? Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, right now, the process is, is not quite accurate because, of course, we have uh, not so much time to uh, improve the algorithm. But yes, in the future, uh, right now, uh, we was able to uh, approximate, uh, stay on about 10 centimeters, something like that. The error, I mean, yeah, for sure. Okay, perfect. Then now we would like to have, um, yeah, one, uh, two short feedbacks from our jury. We would like to start with Emmanuel. Okay, hi everyone, um, a very impressive presentation. Um, very professional, so I, I really like it. Uh, very well explained, uh, all the technical level that uh, uh, an audience of uh, of deciders uh, can uh, can understand without going too much into the details and showing the, the potential uh, next step. So it's great. Uh, just one room for improvement. Uh, you are seven, and there you are four. So uh, how you share the work together? and uh, as a team, and uh, how the three others uh, worked. Uh, this is what I do not see here, even if you show that you are a team, but here you are four. So, uh, so this is uh, the only thing I'm a little bit lacking, but great presentation, great job. Yeah, thanks. Then the next yeah, feedback will come from Stefan. So I can agree, this was a really good presentation, really well prepared. Also really good slides, um, not too much information, like really on the point. And uh, you uh, you could see that you really made thoughts about it. You were, thought, were thinking also about the business model. So that was like you covered like really all the, the points um, needed. There was like one point uh, where you can improve no? when you really want to pitch a solution and you actually answered it then in the Q&A is um, the, the, what is the benefit for the customer. No? If you can bring this better in the presentation, this would be really good. Yeah. As I said, you answered it and then with the risk on the roadside, I mean, then people really can see what this solution will bring them. Yeah. Plus also, like one thing to add, um, what each of you guys did actually in the team, like what was, so to say, your position. Yeah. But otherwise, it was, it was really good. Well done. Good, thanks a lot. So, okay, let's switch to the next challenge. Johannes, who's also a colleague from Digital Industry, will give us some insights of the topic and what was the problem or the idea. Thank you very much. 
Um, I had the honor uh, to coordinate Challenge 2. Uh, the goal of Challenge 2 was uh, to, de uh, to detect uh, this packaging within a shelf and, um, and make, the, uh, make the grabbing of it with a Siemens robot arm and place it uh, on the ground. So we wanted, uh, so also we used the latest uh, Siemens hardware for AI for the neural networks. And we also we worked together with some open source code with ROS and Linux working on Siemens hardware. So have fun the next 10 minutes uh, with our group. And I also would like to thank you for all the effort you put into the challenge and all uh, thanks to all of my colleagues who uh, worked hours and hours uh, that we could achieve that. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. I'll quickly start and jump right into it. As you can see, as a human, you have to be quick. You have to adapt, you have to be flexible. You have to work in every environment. But still, sometimes it's not easy to fulfill your task, right? But now what comes if you handle nuclear waste? Or just as an example, you deal with biological hazards, such as, for example, Ebola, what happens then? But let's tone it down a little bit, right? Let's go to carrying out heavy physical work. What's happening then? This is where robots come into play. The idea of having someone to support you, who can go where you can't go, who, who can do things that you can't do, who will augment your elements that you can't do, and, but you also have to have someone that can react rather quickly. We try to tackle this challenge one by one, and today we're go not going to solve everything. We're not going to handle nuclear waste, but we, we're going to go to somewhere far more dangerous. We're going into the factory. And in the world of automation, you have multiple challenges. The first one is currently, if you have a new product coming into your organization that you don't know before, you have to deliver time to your customer. You have to react quickly. You have to do that. There is no other way. Second of all, your factory might change. You have a modular factory that can adapt. You have modular tasks. Everything gets getting more flexible. You have to adapt more quickly, which also in our world is no problem at all, right? We have time. We have brilliant engineers. And we have time, right? Well, we don't. That's the, one of the key problems, that we just don't have this time that we can invest to solve these solutions. So we have to have a very quick and efficient way to tackle these challenges. And one of these, challenge, these ideas is what we have, that we take AI and let it drive automation, basically. But once again, let's take a small step back. We, want to, we don't want to solve everything right now. We want to leave something up to others. And therefore, we just take one step at a time. So this time, we chose a neural network that we're going to train as an AI approach. For, as always, first we have to acquire data, then we have to model everything, the surroundings around it, then we're going to deploy said model, and then we are in the world of automation, where we then can do the most important thing, we can take action. And this is where we're aiming at. But starting at data acquisition. As always, as you probably know, you need training data at first. What you can do, well, to train a neural network, you can do it manually. So basically, you sit in front of your laptop, and you always say, okay, this box from there, this is a Kellogg's box, this is another Kellogg's box. And you do this for a couple of hours, you have enough training data, you throw it in there. One approach, we did that. Then we considered, okay, let's make it more efficient, so make it more robust. So we wrote a small script, we photographed the small box, cut it out, and then just let this script throw out various backgrounds, completely different backgrounds, as you can see, from guitars to dinosaurs to make the system more robust so that it can detect this Kellogg's box right away. And another idea that we had, but unfortunately this is future work, we thought about, okay, we just take a robot arm, we combine this um, with a camera, and so if you have a new product, you put it into a robot arm, you let it turn, a script synchronizes those movements, and you can automatically label the element which is right in the middle, which, where you can save even more time, but unfortunately we, we didn't have that. And for the modeling approach, I would forward everything to Raven. Thanks very much. So, having all this training data, we would like to train a network, it already said. Here in this picture, on this slide, you can see 
three different networks. On the left-hand side, you can see a network which failed. So you can see different boxes, and it pretty much recognizes everything, but it recognizes everything wrong. So it's not what you want to have. On the right-hand side, you have two other networks. One of is um, done with the manual labeled data, the other one with the automated labeled data. You can already see that both of them can recognize the boxes as you want to have it, and also the automated approach is um, similarly efficient as the manual one. Even more efficient and a little bit stable, more stable, like you can see on these videos. So I said on the left one, there are pretty much boxes, pretty many boxes, and that's not what you want to have. Um, to see how our, our networks um, con converged, you can take a look on this graphic. It can be seen there's a loss graphic, uh, a loss, um, some loss data and some iteration data. In the end, you can see um, it converged pretty well. And um, you can also see in this picture that we used an already pre-trained network. What else can be modeled? Well, of course, we have our neural network, which is the model of the picture you can see. But also, we need a um, model of the real world, which means we modeled a digital twin of our real environment. So here you can see the Siemens robot together with the shelf and the wall behind. It all removes, it's simulating all the stuff which has to be done. And by doing so, you can prevent collisions, for example. You can prevent um, that um, movements are done which are not supposed to be done. And by doing so, you can be more time efficient later in the factory, for example. So having the model of the real world, having the model of the um, neural network, you can actually start up to do your setup. But some stuff is still missing. So for example, the connection between um, all the single um, steps as said before. So what did we do? We used our YOLO network, transferred, uh, transferred it via Darkflow to a TensorFlow network and used it to put it on the NPU of Siemens, the neural processing unit, which is kind of an add-on for the PLC. So now we can process a neural network in the factory and are still a re on a reliable track. What else? Well, here in the picture you can see it. We have our robot which is moving, and at the same time we have our digital tr twin which is moving. So we simulate it at the same time. We can see whether it works pretty well or not pretty well, even if we are not at the same place. We can already see whether in the future there will be some collisions or any dangerous stuff which might be there. So having this, we can um, do it in the real world. You can see the robot, which is now grasping to the boxes, taking one of the boxes and put it where you want to have to put it. <laughs> well, of course, it's still a prototype. <laughs> but as I said, the robot is now putting in there where you want to put it. For example, on the automated vehicle <laughs> of the group before us. But why do I, are we doing all of this? Well, we would like to address the pain points which we already said earlier. When you have a new product, you want to be flexible. When you have a new factory layout, you don't want to adapt everything. Because actually, you don't have enough time. We need this time, but you don't have. So for that reason, to add AI to the automation world is a really good step because by doing so, you can, be, uh, you can have a flexible automation solution which can have adaption to every single um, new product which you want to have. And by adding, for example, other solutions like a robot approach to label data, it's pretty fast forward, uh, it's going pretty fast forward to produce new data, new solutions for the factory of the future. Yep, and to finalize, well, as Neil Armstrong uh, almost said that's one small risk for the robot, but one giant leap for mankind. And in this case, mankind means all of us, but also the wonderful team that was, has been working with us there. We were just merely the representatives. Therefore, would like to ask all the team members to come up front, the, ones, the students, but as well the Siemens team, which helped tremendously figuring out the tiny little problems and was supporting us in any way. So please come forward, and then we are ready for your questions. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks again. 
then let's go directly to the question and answering round. Some questions from the jury. Are there someone? Also able to realize what he's grabbing, actually. So he knows uh, this is the chocolate chips, and I have to bring them over there. And this is, uh, I don't know. I'll leave it up to the expert then, who wants to answer. In the future, yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> A very good answer, <laughs> Siva. <laughs> So you used basically some uh, camera video input for um, then doing the classification. Did you use the same camera for the training as well? So probably because I still feel uh, also in the previous challenge that maybe uh, using a higher resolution camera might help a lot. It looks still a lit little bit blurry. So what do you think you could still improve if you would have HD plus there? Yes. So you have a very efficient answer. So basically, we could improve it tremendously. The problem of the resolution is well known. We tried a couple of other solutions. Um, we tried to have our different camera feed as well. But the limiting capacity that we had was training the network. And therefore, we couldn't just try train different things manually and see how that works. So we can only estimate that we can improve it even further. I mean, just the automated data generation approach increased the accuracy tremendously. And starting from there, there's still room for improvements. If you would like to continue with some research uh, on this case now, where do you think um, is it more worthwhile to go deeper in the AI uh, part uh, with uh, the object recognition or rather in the digital twin uh, approach and the modeling? Since I'm from the digital twin team, I'll leave it up to the experts. I'm a bit biased there. Well, I would say that there's always some stuff to do in the AI area. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, I think it's pretty interesting to compare the manual um, labeled data and the automatically labeled data. I think it's pretty interesting to take a look into this topic. OK, maybe a question from the audience. If not, we will go directly to the feedback from the jury. Ariana, what do you say? Yeah, first of all, congratulations to the entire team, to the whole team. Great presentation, great work you did in uh, those past four days. Um, so I'm really happy to see uh, how far you have come. So I think also now uh, looking at your um, presentation, I think it was uh, really an excellent talk. So you um, had a very clear um, clear presentation style um, made come clear to the point. Um, so what is it that you're addressing? Um, uh, what is your solution? And uh, how far have you come? Um, I think if I would like to recommend a little bit um, improvement. So um, I find that often uh, when you have a problem and then you come, uh, OK, and my solution is AI. So what I like is if you get a bit more specific on so what kind of AI and how does this solution really solve your problem. So not just being very unspecific like okay it's AI so just go into yeah make it more clear and precise. So that was introduced um, from the um, from Johannes who presented the challenge first what is really um, in factory automation and the current problem but it was not so clear to me in your presentation. And the second thing um, I would like to recommend is, um, so each of you of the two presenters, you were very clear in your presentation. I think you could even improve if you just appreciate what also the others say. So um, if you, um, it was like when you were done, then you were happy <laughs> to just step back and relax a little bit. It's um, more um, interactive if you look at your colleague and uh, also appreciate and listen. So it might be that you have already heard it uh, several times, but still it gives a different impression. But overall, again, um, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. OK, then let's come to our second feedback from Sebastian. 
Yeah, congratulations. So I see you are really enthusiastic about this topic. And uh, so the intro was really cool into uh, the area, which, uh, of course, uh, if you make people smile in a pitch in the beginning, that's definitely already setting the stage for cool things to come. And of course, uh, as a scientist, I'm happy to see that you also took a certain technical approach and uh, showed some results. Uh, therefore, of course, that's uh, good to convince the scientists, so I'm happy with it. Um, if I would, uh, yeah, beyond all the things that Ariana already mentioned, uh, give uh, one recommendation. Um, it's probably, from coming from scientists, uh, sounds weird, but give the baby a name. So uh, if you uh, are selling something to me, so I was totally motivated uh, with all the setting the stage and all the things, and then I got a bit of a technical talk. So if you would say, okay, we give this thing the name amazing flow for AI in uh, industry or whatever, and, and you, you put it together and then say these are the parts and that's how our framework or whatever you want to sell it is called, that might even make people more attached to your solution. So that would be my recommendation, but excellent job. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. Perfect. Then let's come to challenge number three. Um, the challenge head is Stefan Liebald. He's from the Technical University of Munich, and he will give a short introduction to the topic. Thank you. So with challenge three, we move a bit away from the machine learning, more in the direction of the IoT part. So Mark Oliver already teasered it uh, previously with the game we have built uh, up there in the back. So you can also have a look at it later if you want. So the challenge here was uh, that the, well, the game itself made it basically is just a, you have uh, different sensors and uh, game logic and all in different microservices that are meshed uh, together using a middleware. And now the challenge here was basically Siemens provided us with uh, two leap sensors, leap motion sensors and uh, Siemens nano boxes for uh, computers. And the challenge was using those devices to uh, create a similar or even cooler game than we had uh, by meshing them together. And yeah, and I, in the end, I must say that a uh, real nice game and also a real nice user interface. Okay, and then I'll hand over to the team, which will tell you more about it. For this function, okay, this one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Uh, we are the group number three, and we're going to present you our challenge number three, which is mashing up uh, microservices using a distributed IoT middleware from sensors to logic, and in our case, sensors are uh, leap motion sensors. Okay. Okay, so, so you probably all know uh, Tony Stark, and if you don't, you should watch Avengers or Iron Man. Um, but have you ever wondered how could he use all his devices by using only his hands? I mean, he's awesome. So we wanted to take a deeper look on what he's doing. Um, thus, we implemented a game using two main technologies, uh, which are uh, leap motion sensors, 
and uh, S2, S2OS middleware. So before explaining these two technologies, my friend will tell you why did we choose these two ones. Okay, so uh, enhancing our interactions uh, with the virtual world can really change our lives. Uh, advancements in uh, sensors, uh, microelectronics, uh, and computing power can already help us uh, interact with computer <coughs> devices in a more uh, natural um, and intuitive way. Uh, and we can already have uh, valuable applications, for example, in healthcare, uh, for the re rehabilitation, excuse me, uh, of uh, patients with physical disabilities. And we can also have applications uh, in the education and research or training um, for uh, uh, the most effective interaction uh, with uh, 3D models. For example, if you dive in virtual reality, uh, you can interact with a machine or a product uh, and see how uh, you can use it or how it feels using it. So this can be used for training of technicians or engineers or even the sales team and the marketing team. Uh, and of course it can be used um, maybe in product design uh, for the most uh, effective um, uh, understanding and uh, modifying and manipulation, manipulation of, uh, of a product model. Thank you. Uh, so one enabling technology is the lip motion sensor, uh, which actually brings your hands into the virtual world. Uh, and enables control um, uh, by a natural user interface uh, based on gestures. So you actually have, it has two cameras and these uh, LEDs. Uh, so it can detect uh, your gestures, how many hands you have uh, above the camera, and for example, how many uh, fingers you have extended uh, and uh, it has already built-in functions, which are also extendable. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, it, you can act like typing in a keyboard or swiping uh, through pages or rotating an object or a button. So you actually uh, feel like having all these uh, input devices around you, but everything, every hardware is compressed to this 7.6 centimeter device. Um, that's for my part. Uh, the other technology that we used is uh, DS2OS. It's a middleware, middleware framework uh, that helps us to uh, let uh, different devices which don't speak the same communication language to let them talk to each other. So basically we um, developed services to talk, for example, to the leap sensor and another, services, uh, another service that helps us to communicate with computers, and then these serv services can talk to each other uh, through the VLS middleware. Um, now I'm gonna give some more explanation about our game and the setup. So uh, the game we built is an educational game that uh, helps children to count. So um, the setup is like this. We have two main computers, each having a leap sensor attached, and it can uh, sense how many fingers you uh, point. For example, if I show three to the sensor, it, it will notice that I show three fingers. Uh, then in the middle we have a laptop containing the game logic and also having a UI. So the UI looks like this. The images can of course be adapted to the age, but we were thought it would be proper for us to have some beers. So um, like uh, in the, this game, uh, player one has to uh, show number three to the leap sensor, player two has to show number one to the leap sensor, and the first person to show three correct numbers in a sequence uh, will win the game. So now I'm going to show a demo of the game. Like in the left screen you see um, the UI and you see in the movie that we're playing the game and like trying to count, trying to win, and you see that Luca is a little bit faster and uh, won the win the game. So this game can be used, for example, uh, with children that have a hard time learning numbers and to engage them to learn numbers because 
just sitting there and learning numbers is really boring, but playing a game while learning is much nicer. The game could also be used, for example, if you have uh, problems, a uh, physical problem with your hand and have to do a lot of exercises by uh, moving your hands. This game can help to yeah, like move your fingers and show two, three. And then I'll, uh, we also thought about some extension and uh, my friend will help uh, tell you a little bit more. Okay, thank you. So we can add, we can have a lot of possible improvements to the game. We can actually integrate some moving gestures, for example, a circle or a swiping, but we didn't want to integrate it because it has no sense to have beers like moving beers. So uh, we also can uh, change the application of the game. For example, we have thought about uh, integrating uh, uh, language sign, language sign data set and training it, for example, with deep learning networks using transfer learning from for example, AlexNet or VGG, and a lot of uh, other improvements we are looking for. So uh, it's the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, uh, we will be delighted to answer them, and thank you. Perfect. So then. We will go direct to the question <laughs> session. Um, are there some questions from the jury? So thank you. And besides your um, very interesting applications in education and healthcare, do you have also something in mind where it could be applied for industry? Uh, well, as she said, I think we can integrate that in, for example, product design or, for example, in training the uh, training the employees. For example, if you have already a machine that is running and you don't want to waste that uh, that time, like uh, uh, just stopping it and doing training for new employees, you can deploy a 3D uh, example of this machine, for example, and by using virtual reality plus leap motion, you can do training on the uh, 3D uh, Example, without having to stop the machine that is already running, for example, in the industry. Thank you. Well, a great job. Uh, I really enjoy all uh, leap motion related stuff, so it's uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, I am more. Uh, I did not get the the purpose of the S2. Uh, what is the value? Of uh, of this, instead of just developing, I don't know Java code using leap motion uh, APIs. What what is the value of using S2 instead of uh, I don't know Java standard things or? Oh, I, I didn't. Yeah, like the middleware framework. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, a framework written in Java, and it just helps us to like um, in a high level way connect the sensors to each other. So we wrote services to connect to the leap sensor. We wrote a service to uh, um, have the game logic and to let these uh, services talk to each other. Uh, the framework took care of this. So we didn't need to write any communication code ourselves, which made it a little bit easier for us. Uh, well, so uh, just uh, now uh, personal feedback from the industrial, because um, I have uh, my office next to uh, our production plant. And uh, yeah, this is clearly useful, very useful to train people, especially on real products and not on VR. Or you can use HoloLens if you want, but uh, on real products you can track movements and then you can uh, you can uh, check, uh, like uh, record the movement of a skilled operator and then show to a new operator the difference of his hands and uh, the skilled worker. And so this has great value for industry, I believe. Uh, I would be a buyer if you have it uh, available to, to train my people already. So great job, thank you. Thank you. Okay, maybe now a question from the audience. Okay, then not. <laughs> maybe from the jury, <laughs> or we will go directly to the Feedback. So, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, a big plus. There are some girls on the stage, the first group. 
and I thought this was a really good presentation because it's a mixed presentation of you know, um, um, a group. Um, uh, one thing which um, just came up to my mind, um, the retrofitting in existing um, uh, systems, CAD systems or something like that, to train, uh, that would be very interesting to have just uh, one remark, um, but this is um, uh, a detail. Thank you very much for your talk. You can applaud if you want. <laughs> <laughs> they deserve it. So uh, one feedback. So one, uh, one. I, I really enjoy how to have a mixed team. I still do not understand why, and this is the same thing for the first three group. I see why does not whole team presenting something uh, instead of some presenters. I know presentation is most of the time life is unfair. Half of the success of your story, it's clear, and some are better for that than others because they are more used to that. But then it's the opportunity to progress for everyone. So uh, well, I always love when the whole team is speaking. I know it's not easy, but it's better. Um, aside this, maybe you took too much time explaining why uh, Leap Motion is so great, instead of explaining why your product is so great. And then uh, referring to a question, uh, a remark before, maybe it needs a name, a catchy name to sell it. And, uh, and again, uh, look at buyers like me and give me even more needs of your product. So, uh, but anyway, that's it. Uh, room for improvement, but uh, great presentation, uh, great dynamic uh, with uh, women and men and perfect. Then let's, thanks again. And we will come now to our last challenge, challenge number four. Um, our partner from IMT, Alexandre, where's Alexandre? Will give the introduction to their challenge. <laughs> you can stay here. No, 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 no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, but he can stay here. It's okay. So, hello. <laughs> so, for this challenge, challenge four, the students were basically given a box, right? A box with sensors and a microcontroller. And the sensors were about air quality data. And the, the stuff to do were very simple. They had to figure out how to make it work and what, how it can be useful for society. So, yeah, simple, right? I don't know. This is their story. Please welcome them warmly. Okay, we got the presenter, the, the joystick in there. So let's give, give us a minute. First of all, I want to, to thank Alexander, Laurent, that coordinated us. Thanks. And now I give to Eric. Hello and uh, welcome to our presentation of Challenge 4, uh, where we uh, propose an IoT solution uh, for air quality measurement. And um, uh, air, quali air quality is a growing problem in uh, every city and uh, uh, Munich as well. And uh, according to the World Health Organization, uh, there will be 4.2 million deaths every year as a result of exposure to, uh, to outdoor air pollution. Um, uh, the biggest problem with air pollution is that it's most of the time uh, not visible. So you can't see the threat you're under uh, when, you're, when you're outside uh, and you don't see the dangers you, uh, you expose yourself to. Um, people uh, can suffer from illnesses such as asthma or chronic coughs um, from, these, uh, from this air pollution without even knowing that, uh, that this was the cause. Um, so what is needed for that uh, is to raise awareness, and uh, in order to raise awareness, uh, we need a vast network of air uh, monitoring uh, stations throughout the city. Um, the way it is done right now, uh, in the, um, as an example in Munich, uh, the German uh, government, the Umweltbundesamt, has four uh, qu air quality measuring stations across Munich, uh, across the city of almost 1.5 million people. Um, so, as you might imagine, 
uh, this is not enough, uh, especially because air quality is really spatial. So I can have really good air here, but in 200 meters at the next intersection is really bad. Uh, reasons for that can be uh, wind, for example. Uh, so it's really important uh, to establish a wide network of, of these uh, monitoring stations. Um, yeah, and the way in Munich the air quality for, for whole Munich is done is they interpolate the values based on these four stations. Um, yeah, and uh, the, um, uh, the business side of it that uh, each year there are uh, approximately five trillion dollars of costs uh, that can be attributed, attributed to uh, bad air, air quality. Um, and there was a huge growing market for these uh, air quality monitoring stations. Uh, sorry. Um, one way to tackle this uh, air pollution problem is by switching to um, alternative transportation methods. One of these uh, transportation methods that we saw arise in, in the last couple of months are these electronic scooters. Uh, the problem these companies have is that there are so many. Like they, they grow like mushrooms after the rain. Like, and uh, for example, we have here four examples of four scooters. Um, and the problems they have is they're not really unique. Sure, they, they may have some different colors and some, like the scooters may be different, but that's not really unique for us. Um, so what we propose is uh, a combination of these, both pro uh, of these problems. Uh, and in order to introduce you to that, we would like to show you a small trailer. Okay, he was the good looking of us. <laughs> <laughs> so this was just, okay, this was a trailer, um, more than a, um, it, it's a demo prototype, what you see uh, attached to the, to the, to the e-scooter, and we, want to, we wanted to show that the demo prototype is actually working, is actually gathering information around the city, and um, it can take advantage of this mobility to go and, and uh, spread this information in the city. So the point is, this is more or less our, uh, the, the points that we treated while we were developing this, this, uh, this solution is that it is based on, on LoRaWAN, so it is a sensor box, uh, let's say IoT based, but uh, the main technology is the communication that is made up with LoRaWAN, exactly. And uh, what we want to stress is upon the comparison with the traditional uh, weather station. They are fixed, so static. They can, as uh, Eric said, they have to interpolate the data to collect some um, accurate data. While in this situation, with this solution, you can gather information more accurate and think of a swarm of electronic uh, scooters that goes around the city, gather data, send them to the gateway, and then they can be visualized and analyzed. Um, we can, of course, uh, put a lot of devices around the city, more than uh, what the weather station are right now. And more, moreover, uh, what we can, what we want to achieve is to people uh, to that ask to contribute to the pollution awareness to be able to do that. So uh, it's kind of raised awareness of people of the from the pollution, but giving them a way to contribute to this. Um, well, basically, this is um, the service that we provide is not just the, let's say, the box that we should sell to our uh, e-scooter company, but also the dashboard, so a platform to visualize those data. Uh, what you see is a heat map of the, the work, the startup work is yet the, the work one, and is actually, so the, a portion of Munich that is uh, shown in a map as a heat map, where, the, uh, where are the most polluted uh, area uh, in red compared with the green one and the blue one that are the less polluted ones. 
Okay, so um, another, another point that is very important, so we don't want just to provide a mobility service to assessing air quality, but we want even to increase uh, the density of um, sensor and gateways to collect data. So we want to put more gateways, more antennas, uh, so LoRa technology all over the place. Um, okay, the, the thing is that um, on the, the platform, uh, you have an alarm if you uh, are going through an area that is polluted. Um, so you have a direct feedback and then you can send the data via, uh, via um, a REST web service that we provided with, uh, with the dashboard uh, to any network company. So basically they can choose then to open access them or to close them to, to make analysis. Um, this is more or less the technology. It's a wonderful IKEA box, which a lot of, <laughs> which a PyCon board actually inside. It's equipped, uh, uh, as I told you, <laughs> with a, a lot of an, uh, with a lot of an, um, uh, communication technology, and it has basically uh, four sensors for humidity, CO2, and then the PM, so the particulate particulate matter, uh, both 10 and 2.5. And what it does is basically calculate an index to assessing air quality through this four measure. And then we have a GPS coordinate sensor that can give us the position that could be helpful even in case of vandalism or this kind of stuff that e-scooters company already have to address. Let's think just on the prices. We got three devices plus one antenna. It costs around 1,000 euros. And this makes uh, this solution much more cheaper than the 5G networks that costs uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of euros compared with this solution and these, and then you can deploy this kind of devices whenever, and this is a prototype, and this as small as you can see there. Uh, well, and <laughs> so there's an entire market to customize this hardware and to make it more feasible to putting on, uh, even if it was there actually in the, in the e-scooter. Um, so um, I want to stress a bit again on the why. It's not just because we want to make people aware of the pollution, that is a great problem, but it's not what we eat of. Uh, the thing is that we hope that the, the Europe will, will put uh, the same money that they put in the, in the seven years in the past, but the Europe is allocating that amount of money, is 1.8 billion euros to, for environmental quality measures. So in, in this sense, to measure the quality of their life, to go through the smart city, one of the main driver should be the welfare. So the environmental quality measure is something that it's really valuable from more than one perspective. So this is the team. Um, it, we are too many and too big, uh, so we cannot stand all year. But we are not just IoT experts. We come all, of course, from a background in computer science. But what we are uh, is someone that really believes that we should be more aware on pollution. We are all uh, car haters, and, and of course, not just that, but we want to use those kind of, of, uh, of scooters and of um, sustainable mobility transportation uh, devices. Um, of course, uh, me and Oliver, uh, we took about, I am Stefano, we, we let's say, uh, go through the code of it. Eric, Fernando, and Benjamin designed the test cases. Mohamed and Ashri, Vladut and Cyprian studied the background and the presentation. And uh, of course, I already, uh, I already thank the, the, our coordinators for the challenge. Last but not least, the call for action is plenty of e-scooters out there. You have a box here. Just one, we have three more if you want all to go with, but <laughs> take one, go for a ride, and contribute to the pollution awareness of your city. Thank you. <laughs> Comes to me. Come. Good, perfect. <laughs> this is Oliver, Nashri, Mohamed, Bladut. Cyprian. I, I call him for the surname. <laughs> Fernando, the one of the video. <laughs> and Benjamin. Okay. Thanks again. Then let's start with the question and answering round. Are there some questions, first of all, from the jury? So, um, 
very impressive talk. Thank you. Um, the device, actually, uh, I uh, assume that currently uh, there is a, a small power supply in there, right? Yes, exactly. So uh, how do you then plan to probably go into a Oliver. production perspective to, to link it to the scooter or something like that? Oliver can enlighten you on this. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so, so far we are running on a small battery, which is included in the box. Um, if we want to deploy it on a scooter, um, for now, as long as it's just a prototype connected to it, it might be fine to run it on a battery and collect it in the evening or so when most of the scooters are already collected to be charged overnight somewhere. Um, on the other hand, if we are really planning to integrate it as part of, on a um, custom PCB as part of the scooter, then we would for sure connect it to the actual electronics in there and also to their battery. Also, some insights on the energy consumption of that. Um, just some uh, back of the envelope calculation gave us that it would um, approximately reduce the um, range of these scooters um, by three kilometers over a 24 hour period. Thank you again. Okay, next one. It's a perfect technology. Okay, you just mentioned that this will decrease the range of the scooters. So how do you motivate actually the scooter providers to use this? Is there like your business model? What is your business model? Well, it increases, the, well, the, the main idea is that it, it should increase the market of these companies. And the thing is that we want to um, since they they are go unique because they have a totally different uh, setup and so people can be aware of the pollution, more people would use their uh, their device, their uh, e-scooter, and so they will increase their their revenues. And we will uh, not just sell the box, but we will sell the method to access to the data. So we basically we cannot just visualize the data on a portal but we can uh, take the data and move to any company network. So they, if they want to analyze their data, they should uh, attach to our service, let's say. That's how we get money from it. Okay, then one last question. If I'm the devil's advocate, I would ask you why you need LoRa if uh, the scooters all uh, probably already have a communication system such that they can be tracked and you get their status and these things. So uh, what's your answer to that? Did someone want to answer or shall I? <laughs> I, I'd be very hot answering today. <laughs> no. Actually, we have uh, two limitations. Uh, I give uh, the first one, uh, we should uh, use this uh, equipment with LoRa technology, but likely the LoRa is uh, low power, its power consumption is very low, uh, battery lifetime will be more, and uh, the second reason, our idea is completely uh, independent from the communication technology, if uh, the scooter company wants to use narrowband IoT, other technologies, SIGFAS, we can change this part of technical component of our solutions, but currently we have this choice. And uh, I would like also to add something regarding your question. In the near future, we can uh, replace uh, LoRa van with 5G narrowband IoT. Uh, because the, the scooters uh, will have enough battery to, to support uh, one day. And uh, one important thing is that uh, 5G narrowband IoT spectrum is licensed and uh, we will not have problems with, uh, with interferences. Thank you. Flexibility and scalability. That's it. Good. Okay, then a short feedback. Sebastian. 
Yeah, great presentation, also great ideas. So of course, uh, this is something which uh, might really have a, a big impact and I like the overall concept. So while with the technical details, I understand that you had certain constraints. I think as an overall idea, it's great. Regarding the business use case, probably it's more a social enterprise than something that uh, makes you all of you billionaires right now. But um, I, I really feel that this is something where um, you can maybe also raise some awareness in people and make um, them contribute or choose really a scooter by adding some benefit to the society. Therefore, I think uh, this is uh, also therefore a really nice presentation to show that um, this has uh, opportunities in the real IoT and this is also a, a IoT project with communication, so probably the only one of all the four we saw. Um, and uh, therefore, great job and um, I hope to see something like that uh, maybe then really integrated into the scooter with a uh, full framework, but I see you already thought about the front end. Thank you, great. Thank you, then we will come to our last feedback from Thomas. Um, yeah, thanks for all the work and that you are spending the week with us here. Um, from my point of view, it's a, a great job what you did. So I think you met you for the first time this week personally. You got a task you have to fulfill and find a technical solution. And what I really like is you combined existing things and developed a new value because the e-scooters, you don't develop this. The technology was still available, but you combine it and with that you generate a new value which we need a business case and we need a customer who's willing to pay for this. But if I think for this, there is an option in the future. So you address an existing problem and you combine things and generate a new value. Thanks for this. Perfect, thanks again. So, Sebastian, next time we have to talk uh, about the hackathon on HDYs and Mindsphere. <laughs> okay, no, uh, no marketing now. <laughs> I would like to uh, overhand Mindsphere. now to Mindsphere. <laughs> Mindsphere. <laughs> Oops, Mindsphere. Good. Um, yeah, I would like to um, overhand now to Mark Oliver. He will give us some information how we go now. Yes, thank you very much. So first of all, before I continue, this is uh, my dongle that is missing. So the team that still has it, please uh, collect it. OK, good. So um, yeah, as said, we will continue with the certificate ceremony, but uh, should have so shown this first. Well done. So you all really did a tremendous job. It was fantastic. So I'm really impressed in what you created in these days and also the way you presented it. I mean, we were following you in creating these presentations and the quality today was much, much better even than when we looked at them a little bit yesterday. So really tremendous job. And I would not want to, want to change with the jury now because the jury now has a really difficult job to judge which was the best presentation. And uh, I'm looking forward to their decision and also to their explanation how they came to the result. And that said, um, yeah, the jury can go upstairs now and uh, discuss. So Katerina will go with you. She will also show you the results from the votings. And uh, we will continue with what I showed before. So we will continue with the certificate ceremony for the participants. Then we'll have the award ceremony because then the jury will already be back. Then we will award the speakers, the entire team, and then we'll have some final thoughts. And uh, this is the rest of the agenda for today. So maybe we give the jury an applause to make them even more happy to start their job. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Perfect, perfect, cool. Okay, so I will need you stay here. So Arne, maybe you can also come here, then uh, we can uh, together do the certificate ceremony. So I organized it in that way that we will always have a batch of around five people. I will show the names and the ideas that you come here. Then you get your participant certificate, you get your um, invoice, 
And uh, you also get the group photo here printed out. I hope I have enough. If not, we can print some more. And uh, yeah, so this is the plan. Here's the list, so maybe we can just mark whom yep. we handed out. Maybe Arne can do that. Or you do it here. Okay, and so then we have the five people here, and then we all s we stand here with you and make a photo in front of this picture here, and then you can go back to your seat, and the next people are coming, and uh, yeah, so this is the plan. And uh, yeah, so these are the first uh, five people, so please come here. So Anna, probably it's the best you go here, because there's the certificates, and then you can just uh, cross them. They are ordered the way you currently have it. Ah, yeah. So we can also we can also show you what is in the uh, in the baggage because we, I'm also very very happy about that because we have real good stuff inside. You will be really happy for receiving it. And uh, Siemens was uh, sponsoring uh, lots of things. Oh, we did not put the we did not put the stickers. So so you so you all have the stickers. So the idea was to put the sticker also on it so you can do it on your own. It's do it yourself creation of your present. <laughs> this is some special feature. And what sh what shall it do? So this is a broken one, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So. Sorry. No, it not broke. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on the one using it. Oh, very nice. Ingenuity for life. <laughs> Our mind's fear. <laughs> I know your, la your laptop display is making... <laughs> and what else is in there, Fabian? We are curious. What else is in the back? Okay, so the power bank, and then we have some flyers, some more stickers. What do you What do you want, Erkin? I don't understand. I cannot remove it; it will destroy his laptop. Here is the uh, Here is the mark. Good. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's working. So someone can take it. It's actually not broken. So I can hand you over the picture already, and the. Uh, so yeah, it has this format because I just printed it. If you want to get rid of the edges, you can just uh, fold them to both sides here. So those of you who contributed to the wall know it already. And then when you do that, then it's just falling up and then you have a normal postcard. Okay, and so now, yeah, but maybe one is missing, so you have to ask. Yeah, yeah, we make one now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So is it working with the certificates? You distributed them? Okay. Yeah, and then we can make a photo maybe with the certificate and you and the and the photo, yeah. And then uh, Christian will make the photo of all of us here. Okay. Ah, there. Yeah. 
Is good? Perfect. Thank you very much. Then we have the... Uh, I also have the presenter. Okay. We have the next group. You don't have to remove the border. I did it already. <laughs> Okay, let's move close together and then we make the uh, make the photo. Will that fit? Will it fit? Good. <laughs> okay, and this is the uh, next group. Yeah, it's going much more efficiently than uh, originally. I wanted to call everybody on their own, and so now I sped it up a little bit. And so maybe we'll also switch then with the speaker because the jury will not be that fast, I guess, afterwards. So you also get the picture. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here you are. You're welcome. Yeah, let's send close and a uh, little closer. Okay, good. Thank you. So at TUM we have like 1,700 people starting each uh, term and uh, this ceremony there takes like for four hours. At least this is how it feels. <laughs> just stay for the photo please. Or if you don't want to be on the photo it's also okay, it's just... There's someone else here who's on the list. <laughs> Not do two or do one more because I forget to change the background. Good. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, next group. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Finally, someone to look up to. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And the next group.
You're welcome. Oh, very good. Like this, you will uh, win any fashion contest. Good. Yes. You're welcome. Wonderful, very good. Congratulations. Okay, so as promised, uh, we are faster than I expected and therefore I will just shift uh, to the speakers now. Okay, award ceremony also for the speakers that uh, did a tremendous job in uh, supporting this uh, event and uh, yeah this is the first group i think it will be sparse is someone there from it so dan left chris not here ingo is not here sumia is not here so then uh, it's even faster <laughs> than the next group so this group is almost uh, complete so we, are we are together yes very good. Do you also want a photo? Do you want the group photo? Sure. Here. How did you get it so blue? Did you work on it? Like uh, Photoshop it or something? It's uh, Lightroom. Thank you. But I'm not Laurent. I think this was how we did it, yes. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yes. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah, yeah. You can test it. There's beer. You can directly go for it. <laughs> okay. Then, um, yeah, the next group of speakers is uh, Christian, Lars, and Harald. Harald? You're expected on stage. Perfect. So I can create more pictures, but I only printed uh, two, so maybe I give it to you now. Yeah, and please another uh, warm applause for the speakers. <laughs> oh, we have to wait a second. Oh, manually in front with the lens. And just do multiple. Good. Thank you. 
and uh, yeah, so these were the uh, were the speakers. But we did not only have speakers, but we also had a fantastic team that made all this possible. And uh, therefore, we also have an award ceremony for the team. So if there are some more Siemens people behind the wall, now you will be mentioned. So please uh, also come over. And uh, yeah, let's start with the with the first uh, round of team. Alexandre, Anne, Baptiste is not here. Birgit, Katarina. Katarina is upstairs. I don't know if someone can check if she has to do something at the moment. Maybe Stefan, have a look. Nur Zertifikate. Wir haben Zertifikate für die auch. Doch. Hier. Nein, das ist die. Das ist das. Ist das. Okay, then we take Katharina whenever she's ready. But the rest of the people, so Anne is here. And Alexandre was here. So Laurent, you know where Alexandre is? He went away? Okay. So then you can bring him the certification. <laughs> no, no, we, com we, co we combine it then with the next round of people. So it's again like um, Christian Lübben, Christian Seitz, Erkin Kirdan, Fabian, and uh, Florian Grams. Yay! <laughs> well, <laughs> so where's your, where's, your, where's your walking light? Uh, you, you look so nude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Christian Lübben, Christian Seitz, Erkin Kirdan, Fabian Rhein, and Florian Grams. So Fabian, I can hand over the certificate to you. Yeah, that would be nice. Erkin is also here, the director is coming. Christian. Congratulations to all of you and clap your hands. Okay, thank you very much. And the next team is Jorgos. Jorgos. Harald Funk, Johannes Ziegler, Jonas Keller and Jonas Witt. Yeah. Okay. So the so I should, shall they come back? Yeah. yeah. If, if, if somebody from the supporting team would like to have also a band who made some bags later to us, we have enough. Also okay. So the supporter team will also get bags, so you can uh, come later. Uh, now you get the certificates. And they are all, I also, I didn't put it in here, but we took a video when we signed all those, because we signed about like 100 sheets of paper. It was really funny, so I will put it online. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Okay, next group, Kevin Reinisch, Lars Wüstrich, Laurent Toutin again, and uh, Lorenz Krieg. Laurent, it's your day. You get so many awards today. <laughs> this is for stuff. The other was for your talk. Yes. It's the most important. When you get many awards, you have to know which award is for what. <laughs> Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Me, Martin Bischoff, Matthias Gerlich, and Michael Fiedler. Martin Bischoff, Matthias Gerlich, Michael Fiedler. Woo! 
I also won one. I <laughs> <laughs> stop photo, 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 business certificate. Good. Thank you. And the next, Miriam Mantel, Nicolas Montavon, Stefan Liebewald, Verena Röhrl. <laughs> Applause. Good. Then, oh, yeah, then this was it. So I think this was the entire supporter team. And uh, yeah, so to, to all the people who supported this, who were making this possible. So as I also wrote it on the certificate, so you really made the difference. So your dedication to this event was really great. So really, really thank you for all the efforts and work that you spent there for making it such a great event for all the participants here. Big applause. Okay, and as I can see in the back, um, our jury is uh, coming down, which is perfect. So that means we are getting closer to getting to know who is the award winner of this year's uh, Summer School IoT Meets AI. So i just move the slides. Die haben sich abgestimmt, die Katharina hat es mit ihm besprochen, wer was sagt. <laughs> ah, Katharina, we have to bring Katharina here first, because she didn't get her certificate yet, and she did a tremendous job. Do you get the certificate? Oh, <laughs> 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 Uh, let's wait a second. I just put uh, find out the picture again for the background. One second. Here is one. Good. Perfect. Very good. All right. So, did the jury find an answer? I think so. Good! I'm really curious. I know that it was tough. I was telling you that it's not an easy job. You can all come and then... So, we should have had some music now that the jury is coming in. So, just imagine there's dramatic music coming. All right, so uh, the rest of the jury got lost. <laughs> it was a really hard process, so they're on the way. Some people could not make it. That's very good. <laughs> Axel, Actually, you have to come. You can bring the food. Ah, some more. Ah, all, all survived it. I'm very happy about that. A big applause for the jury. <laughs> so you're giving the explanation? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> but you can just, also say some words. I'm Here is the microphone. I'm just a lawyer, but uh, I think the, um, the young lady took all the notes. So, uh, Katharina, will, will you explain the votes? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well.
Well, the second um, challenge, um, Fabian, you can maybe recite the name so of it. What was the second challenge? <laughs> what was the name? YOLO, the YOLO arm, right. Okay, the YOLO arm. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, a really great um, combination of uh, AI and IoT, and especially as an application for warehouses or um, a shop floor um, systems, it's, um, yeah, it's uh, very, yeah, perfect um, application in the future. So that's why <laughs> it won. Did you prepare the certificates? Perfect. He brings it over. So you can come here now, the winners. You can come to the stage and uh, get your additional certificates and presents here. You will not get a second bag, but you will get the famous glass of beer that you can then directly start with the fridge there to fill it. And you have the certificates with the most signatures. So you have, uh, I think, nine signatures on it. Awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Good job. And good answers <laughs> in the future. Oh, I will go to the other side again it's because you are the ones in the center. Yeah, very near. So you will get a new one. It's the right oh. name. I'm <laughs> glad you won. Thank you. You did a really great job. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, your name is the right okay. one, but the challenge name the right is wrong, yeah. so oh, okay. <laughs> and it's, it's more for the picture now. Need to you will get a new one. <laughs> oh. Okay. Big applause, please. Yeah. And also, oh, sorry. Oh, we have to yet. Good. Thank you very much. Very good. Take your prize. All right. We have to make another picture with the prize, obviously. We forgot that. Yeah, we wanted to keep all those for us ourselves, so this is why I didn't hand them over. So here is the... Uh, and let's make a second photo with that one, of yeah. course. So everybody has one? Good. A little bit more casual like this. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's make another photo, obviously. Oh, yeah, we can... Uh, we can uh, let's, let's make first that one, and then let's make one where we, where we toast each other with them. Can you put down the, the smartphones because we will take their picture? <laughs> it's not so cool. <laughs> so now you can. And now let's make one more where we like toast each other here together. That will look funny probably. Yeah, it is empty because we are fast drinkers. Good. Congratulations once again. And uh, yeah, congratulations not only to the team that was selected now because you all did a totally great job as I said before. So the jury had to choose one winner and uh, this was the winner. And so now the jury is probably wondering why there are six people and there are six more glasses. It's a very difficult quest, of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, okay. of course, we also want to award the jury. The jury will also get one of these um, mugs here. And uh, so this is the jury again. So please uh, step forward. And uh, yeah, we also have certificates for you.
So, and you get also the picture, and for you, I especially get this, uh, this removed. So, uh, here's you. Uh, here's yours. So. Dieses, oder? Hatte ich euch vergessen. Hier. Sehr gut. So. So let's also stand here in the middle and then make another uh, picture. Okay. Ah, yeah, you can also toast each other. You're not so many people. <laughs> Maybe make some of three more with the other logo in the back. <laughs> A little closer. Perfect. So thank you very much. A big applause. You did a great job. Doria, well deserved. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for supporting us. Good. So um, for, the, for the people in the jury, if you have like 10 more minutes left after we finish, which will be very soon. So with all the other participants, I filmed yesterday a three minutes short Q&A. What's your name? Where you're from? Why is IoT important? Why is machine learning important? If you would also come up with me and do just this short clip, would be great because I want to cut it together in the video afterwards, if you have some more minutes. Um, yeah, besides that, this is also the end again. So this is a slide from the beginning. So sorry that it's uh, animating uh, so much now. So... Um, yeah, let's see how many stuff. So Marlene, if you are still here, I've seen you before, you're also welcome here. So I would ask these people, these are the challenge heads, especially also Fabian and Katarina to come up here again, because uh, you did a lot of stuff for, for making this working here. You were definitely key people, so please come up to the stage again. So um, Florian Grams, Harald Funk, Johannes Ziegler, Stefan Liebwald, Alexandre Marquette, Fabian, Katarina, Lars, Stefan, Christian, Erkin, Marlene, please all come to the stage. So all the people mentioned here, please come to the stage. And who will be able? Are you able to take a photo with the camera? Yeah, you? The other one? The other one? Okay, and now I want to hear the, the biggest applause of all, because these people really did a fantastic job. Great. Really, thank you all once again. You did a fantastic job. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, that was the pre-last slide. Uh, the third last slide. So this is the pre-last slide. So if you have more photos, also if you travel home now and then you unload your SD cards, it would be great if you would share them with us. This is the thing that I sent around from the beginning. Upload them to the, uh, to the website. We will then put them to a folder where you can all download them afterwards. So we just collect them and then we'll offer them to you in the next weeks. The videos of all the talks are already online, so they were online the moment we stopped the stream, so they were online from the moment the people were talking here, so you find them over the agenda. The slides we will also collect and put online either via the website, if this is possible, if the people are okay with that, or we put it into the private share that we share together with you. 
So please think about that at home, upload the videos. When you have something more on your smartphone, it's also very easy, please do so, upload. If you want to Twitter some more stuff, do so. And uh, yeah, that uh, brings me to the last slide. So it was a great pleasure with all of you. So for me, the greatest thing with teaching, getting to know new people is to see people who are creative, who are enthusiastic in doing things, and all of you were enthusiastic in doing things, so it was great to sit together with you yesterday until late at night, even though I was almost, almost like falling asleep then. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure with you. Have a safe travel home, and maybe we'll have the opportunity to do something together in the future. We would be happy about that. Thank you very much. That closes the summer school.